No. Okay, thank you, Kamel. Uh, so my name is Matti Noponen. I actually wish you all good afternoon already because it's it's uh, above uh, noon in fin Finnish time already. Uh, so I'm coming from a company called Elkoten, working as the director of technology technology at our company. Uh, Timo is also also coming from Elkoten, and then we have a co. Uh, presenter here as Xiufusun from Technical University of, of Denmark. And we are talking about high temperature electrolysis and co-electrolysis today. Let me see the time. Yes. So a uh, brief introduction to what, what the presentation outline will be today. So explaining who we are at Elgoten and DTU, then going a bit to the uh, Technolo technological advantages of, of our Elkotsen products, then uh, into the uh, C2 fuel project, what we are doing both Elkotsen and DTU in the project, and then finally to the acknowledgements. Elkotsen is a company uh, working on solid oxide technology, and, and we were established to Estonia already 2001. We have now also, also office in Finland, uh, where we are focusing on the stack technology. Our Estonian colleagues are, are focusing on the unit cell technology of this solid oxide cell, uh, in this solid oxide fuel cell, fuel cell and electrolyzer technology. Our company uh, company's background is really in the R&D. What we do is, is that, that we want to deliver uh, the highest uh, possible uh, efficiency reliability for this technology to the markets with the reasonable cost that, that also the customers can afford to pay this, this technology. Today we have eight patent families with over 70 patents uh, and we have sold uh, worldwide our products to over uh, 100 customers at the, at the moment. Uh, and the customer bases are in more than 25 countries uh, as per, and, and we are still a startup company only with about 40 persons, both in Estonia and Finland. The product families uh, are, uh, are of, of Elgoten are the uh, uh, anode supported uh, unit cell structures, anode supported in means of fuel cell, cathode supported as me, means of, of electrolyzer technology. The added value what we are bringing to the market is that our technologies uh, operated at uh, reduced temperature at 650 degrees is about both our unit cells and the stacks. The, st the unit cells can be bought, uh, bought also uh, from the company as well as the stacks. So the uh, customer basis what we have is the uh, stack manufacturers for our unit cell products and then system manufacturers for our stack products. DTU uh, technical uh, Technical University of, of uh, Denmark uh, has a department of energy conversion and storage uh, where uh, the focus of the group is in, in the fuel cell and electrolyzer technology based on both uh, high temperature solid oxide uh, technology and then uh, low temperature polymer, polymer exchange membrane technology. And both of these technologies can be used uh, as fuel cells as also for electrolyzers. Then uh, the group has also activities on battery uh, in the field of, uh, of batteries, gas separation, and then uh, next generation solar cell technologies. Uh, DTU has over uh, 200 employees, researchers in, in this field, and uh, strong focus is in industrial collaboration, industrial relevant processes. And more specifically about the solid oxide cell uh, technology at DTU, uh, they have uh, the expertise, expertise starting from raw materials, going from the powders, then to the unit cell production, uh, characterization of these uh, to the stacks with stack materials, coatings, and then to the system, overall systems where, where these technologies can be utilized both in the electrolyzer and fuel cell applications. And then has also extremely uh, deep knowledge about uh, the modeling activities of this technology. The solid oxide technology is, is uh, really versatile in that sense that uh, the application ranges are almost 
almost non or, or there's, there's a lot of uh, different variation in the applications that, that this technology can work. I think uh, maybe maybe the most uh, well-known applications are in the field of, of micro CSP applications where a single single and multi-family uh, households are powered with, with fuses and, and these sort of applications exist mostly in Japan at the moment. Uh, Elgogen is, is focusing on the commercial and in industrial CSP application with, uh, with our fusel uh, products and then, uh, then we are now entering more and more to the electrolyzer field also. The Elgogen advantage is, is uh, the extremely high efficiency that that we can get from our products. Uh, we have we have already uh, tested or, or demonstrated over 75 uh, percent efficiency conversion efficiency from from natural gas into electricity, and uh, what we uh, and we are expecting to have lifetime exceeding also five years with our technology, and then in the real mass manufacturing uh, hope to. Uh, reduce the cost below uh, below 500 euros per kilowatt uh, level. Uh, the cost is mostly driven by uh, the manufacturing volume for this technology. We have, of course, like, like others, uh, examined our cost uh, uh, really closely with our manufacturing partners. And what we can basically see is that uh, we when we are when we are increasing the uh, production volume, we are decreasing uh, the stack price, and we should should be already uh, giving really uh, interesting proposal for the market uh, when we are producing about 10 megawatt annual uh, production capacities. At the moment, we are also starting a new factory project uh, which aims to introduce uh, over 50 megawatt annual production capacity for the fuel cell markets. The new factory will be located in Estonia. Uh, the advantages then, uh, like I said, uh, the, one of the major advantages of, of Elgogen stack technology and the unit cell technology is it's uh, really extremely high uh, energy conversion efficiency. What, what has been measured, for example, with our commercial uh, three kilowatt size stack exceeding 75 percent at part load part load conditions and then exceeding 73 percent at our nominal uh, nominal power load conditions and this is already done uh, at inlet temperatures uh, below 600 degrees the lifetime of these technologies is, of course, always the question mark. What we are doing at the moment is that uh, we are we are doing laboratory testing uh, in in a uh, fuel cell system, and and we have exceeded already 20,000 hours operation uh, time, almost three years nowadays, and and we have the degradation rate within within this test below. 0.4% uh, or 15 milliohms uh, per centimeter per 1,000 hours. And if we assume linear degradation, then then uh, our stack technology should have a, a lifetime exceeding 40,000 hours or five years lifetime. Then going uh, to more into the C2 fuel project, if you missed uh, the posted presentation earlier today, there was an excellent Excellent presentation uh, already given from C2 Fuel project uh, by Berenge uh, just a just couple of minutes ago. In this project, Elkotsen uh, is uh, responsible of providing the uh, high temperature steam electrolysis technology uh, for the project. So we are delivering both the unit cells for the testing, the stacks for the testing at DTU, and then later on the system for the final demonstration. Uh, for, for Dunkirk Harbour. Uh, DTU's role in the project is to conduct the unit cell and stack characterization testing and then also stack modeling uh, within this project. Uh, just to give short introduction still to the C2 fuel project, also Kamel, Kamel gave, gave this already uh, a bit earlier today, but the idea here is that uh, we are Combining uh, the hydrogen feedstock from, from the electrolyzer unit that, that uh, Elgogen is, is delivering uh, to the uh, uh, demonstration site, 
and then this is combined with the CO2 that is uh, coming from the uh, steel steel factory and and then combined uh, uh, cycle uh, combined power plant uh, at the Dunker Harbor, and the aim is to produce then uh, dimethyl ether and and formic acid from these uh, from these feedstocks. Uh, we are a small part of the uh, whole project. This this highlights all the all the partners who are involved in the project. Like I said, uh, Elgosen and DTU are responsible about hydrogen production in this project. Uh, some words about uh, what is what is meant for the steam electrolysis, what is meant for the co-electrolysis. Uh, in the steam steam electrolysis, we are taking uh, the electricity and, and hopefully from the renewable sources. Uh, and then this is combined with uh, steam at high temperature. Typically, typically at, at uh, above 600 degrees is somewhere typically at 700 to 900 degrees. Is. Uh, uh, together with electricity and, and, and steam, we produce hydrogen, and then on the other side of the of the uh, uh, cell, we are producing then pure oxygen. Uh, when this is then, uh, uh, if 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 we want to make uh, to make uh, liquid uh, synthetic fuels out of uh, out of the hydrogen, we of course need to have the CO2. Uh, typically. There, there is a uh, requirement to have a reforming technology uh, between between this uh, the synthetic or, or to produce the synthetic gas. We want to also convert the CO2 into CO rich gases, and then then uh, this can be made, for example, with a reforming technologies, water gas shift reaction, or, or likewise. And then we produce the synthetic gas, which is then uh, then can be fed to the final final reactor. Whereas in the coal electrolysis, we are actually feeding both steam and then carbon dioxide directly to the uh, solid oxide cell stack, and then we produce directly hydrogen and carbon monoxide. Simplifies uh, the overall process of, of uh, generating synthetic gases. In, in any case, also, with the uh, high temperature steam electrolysis, the efficiency can be improved quite drastically compared to the polymer electrolyte or alkaline uh, electrolyzer technologies. Uh, within this project, what we are doing is, is a detailed characterization of our helicopter unit cell technology by DTU. This is uh, an the two examples of, of the testing that DTU is doing within the project. Uh, on on left hand side, we have the steam electrolysis uh, mode, uh, current voltage curves uh, together with the uh, reactant utilization zone uh, done at four different temperatures. What we can basically see that that of course at high temperature, higher temperatures, the efficiency is, is always better, but we still reach. Uh, High, really high efficiencies already at that 650 degrees. We can also see that that uh, when we are doing co-electrolysis, the uh, efficiency of the react reaction is about the same as uh, within the uh, direct steam electrolysis mode. Uh, the interesting thing here is that that we actually exceed. Uh, or, or we are below the specific energy consumption of the thermoneutral uh, region, which is which is 1.28 for this technology uh, at, at already at that uh, really relevant current densities. And in uh, in theory, theory at least, this means that we can exceed uh, efficiencies with 100% unit with the steam electrolysis technology if the steam is uh, is without any any additional uh, energy cost for the for the system. Uh, the specific energy consumption value, uh, this 3.06, is also uh, also uh, quite much more lower than than what is expected to have from the polymer electrolyte or then from the alkaline electrolyzers, which is about four kilowatt hours per uh, produced cubic meter of, of hydrogen. What is then also interesting about this co-electrolysis technology is that we can fairly easily also uh, 
uh, make the outlet composition that is coming out from the unit cell uh, or tailor made the outlet composition that is uh, coming from the unit cell uh, by by uh, adjusting the current and the temperature as well as of course the inlet gas composition and pressure uh, to the to the equilibrium composition uh, that that is at these these conditions and and it has been shown quite many times that that uh, uh, the co-electrolysis uh, works in, in really, really nicely with the equilibrium uh, reactor, as an equilibrium reactor. What we are also doing, and, and this is the main focus maybe in the, in the uh, cell testing and, and also the stack testing in the later stage of this project, is to understand uh, the lifetime limiting factors of, of this technology also. This one example on the right-hand side shows shows how uh, critical it is actually to understand uh, all the conditions that are within the unit cell and then later on also in the stack. We have the green line here is uh, is done at sort of uh, quite normal condition uh, for the unit cell where we basically see virtually no degradation, almost zero degradation when this is measured from 800 hours onwards. We always see the, with this technology an initial degradation that is that is at the, uh, this uh, from zero hours to about uh, 600 hours, and this is from the deactivation processes of the catalyst. But then, when we are changing our operate, operating parameters, we can easily get to a region where uh, this uh, the degradation, so the increase of voltage over time, is is then escaping quite uh, quite rapidly. Mati, Kamal speaking. We will have yes. to very soon finish the presentation for some question. Yes, I will. I will do that. What we are then doing also in the project is that that we are doing the final demonstration. We have uh, developed the process within Elcogen. We are now in the phase that that uh, all the components are in uh, order and and uh, the installation of the components into containers will start, and then acknowledgements for the project funding from EU and then the partners also. So, thanks for the attention. Thank you very much, Mati and Kshufu Timo for this very nice uh, presentation. Uh, we may have the time for two or three questions uh, from the floor. Is there any? Uh, I don't see any question uh, in the chat. Okay, I will be here. At least uh, this session uh, all yeah. works. I, I can ask maybe uh, two, two, two little question. Um, one first question would be uh, to you, uh, Mati. Uh, do you see some uh, application for other e-fuels and liquid fuels? And do you have already some ongoing projects? For example, e-methane or uh, fish tropsh? We, we actually have uh, one, one national project here in Finland that was just started uh, in the in the uh, in the start of this year, which is which is done together with uh, with the Finnish Finnish partners, uh, the uh, VTT and and Convion. Convion is the system integrator for our our technology, uh, and then then uh, it is uh, based on also for the Neste Neste refinery application then onwards. Thank you very much, Mati. Uh, there is a question from uh, Michael Sampas uh, from Keo Green. Could you could you elaborate on the degradation mechanism in the first six hundred hours on the uh, figures you sh you displayed? Uh, this is there's there's multiple uh, mechanisms that is causing causing this initial degradation. Uh, the sort of most uh, known mechanism is the nickel migration from the triple phase boundaries. Uh, at the at the cathode side of the of the uh, cell, the nickel nickel gets uh, fairly volatile at these temperatures, and then then also the uh, uh, the electrical field is is trying to move that away from the triple phase boundary. So it's a mostly reorientation of of the nickel nickel structures, but then there is also also some some act, uh, deactivation processes that are coming from the uh, impurities that are present in the raw materials as well as then then from the uh, gases that we are feeding to the to the units. 
Okay, thank you very much, Mati. So thank you again for this very nice presentation. Uh, if there are some more questions, don't hesitate to contact uh, Mati or even to write it in the chat uh, so that we can uh, he can take it over later on. Thank you, Mati. Thank you. Uh, so now it will be time for presentation of uh, Professor uh, Jose Serra. So it was my bad duration of the presentation are 15 minutes and we'll let five minutes for the presentation for the question. Uh, sorry. So Professor Serra, you can uh, show your presentation. Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. So the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Very good. Thank you, Carmen, for the introduction. So I'm going to show you uh, the ICOCO project. Uh, fundamentals and a little bit of, of our progress. So uh, I'm Jose Serra, so I'm, I'm professor at, at CSIC, the Spanish uh, Research Council, and uh, specifically in the ITQ, so Institute of Chemical Technology, that is well, well very well known for catalysis and molecular sieve zeolites, and it's a joint center with the Polytechnic University of Valencia. So the project ICOCO, so the title is uh, Direct Electrocatalytic Conversion of CO2, into chemical energy carriers, in this case jet fuels, in a cryonic membrane reactor. So as you see, we are dealing with direct and membrane reactors, so it will be about, about process intensification and CO2 use. So the idea, and that was the, the, the scope of the of the topic in the in the call, so is to use a renewable electricity power together with CO2 capture from, from industry. So as you will see, it's steel making, cement industry, refinery and waste uh, management, and convert uh, the power with the power, CO2 and steam, of course, in a single step or a, as or as intensive as possible, the CO2 into uh, different molecules, hydrocarbons, so either uh, fuels, so our target is, is jet fuels, but can be used for other purposes, but also our technology can be used for producing other commodities or building blocks for, for the industry. So about the context, so the state-of-the-art CO2 to fuel technology uh, is based on multi-stage processing. So typically we have a separate water electrolyzer uh, either PM or alkaline or, or soft, if, if we are lucky. And then uh, this is produced and we are producing uh, as a byproduct uh, valuable oxygen. And oxygen is first, uh, is hydrogenated in different steps, including cooling down, water separation, uh, pumping or compression, cooling up, down. And, you know, when you are doing multi-processing, so that the energy efficiency is, is dropping. Uh, by nature, by the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, so this is uh, producing an increase on, on CAPEX. The other one was OPEX. And uh, the, the, the use of resources is not optimized. So our approach is dealing with process intensification as I advance. Our idea is to change some of the reactors that are in sequentially uh, coupled with uh, separations and compressions together in a single unit that will be able to transport CO2 in a single step in a, in a fuel while coupling thermally and also uh, with mass transfer with the steam electrolysis. Uh, this technology is based on the technology that barely developed by a, by a, a consortium that is uh, together uh, Costec, University of Oslo, Sintef and, and ourselves. So this is our approach. So our idea is to have a single reactor. I don't know if you can see my pointer uh, here. A single reactor where we are feeding the steam and CO2 and we produce the hydrocarbons and separately oxygen. So that our target is jet fuel. Um, we will uh, target a high uh, energy efficiency. Of course, this is uh, theoretical and will not be demonstrated within the, the scale of the project, but theoretically we want to demonstrate that at cell level together with process engineering modeling, we want to have a compact size reactor and have a, as much as possible integration while minimizing the risk of the process intensification like a potential breaking or overheating as we'll see. And the final theorem is five. I will show a picture of the, of the setup. So which are the, the, the motivations for this process intensification behind this project? So 
One is in situ heat integration. So we want to integrate uh, the chemical reactor that is by nature so uh, exothermic, the, the CO2 or CO hydrogenation, and the water electrolyzer. If we can run the electrolyzer in endothermic mode, we can match both. So having a balanced exothermic hydrocarbon synthesis and endothermic water splitting, and also that will enable to avoid too much overheating of the reactor. That is a typical problem uh, in CO2 hydrogenation reactors, for example, methanation. If we look at, for example, a methanation process, so we have uh, the heat demand is a slight heat demand of the reverse water gas shift, so CO2 to CO, and the electrolysis. If we can have a nice uh, cell that can operate uh, below the endothermal uh, voltage, we can compensate the heat demand with a heat evolution that is methanation and the joule effect. This is a heat production, not heat demand. So that is one of the motivations. The second motivation is about shifting the equilibrium in the reaction. So we can, if we can remove water from the reactor, we can shift the equilibrium. So if we have a, a simple calculation, this is for example, CO2 to ethylene. This is only thermodynamics. Here uh, we have uh, the the conversion, so the, the the limitation by equilibrium of the ethylene gel is around 65. But if we are extracting the water from the reactor, we can achieve, of course, full conversion. And depending on the type of separator, this is, for example, a, a, a simple water permeable, like, uh, for example, a polymeric or molecular sieve, water permeable, we follow this line. If it is electrochemical regenerative uh, water extraction, that means we are producing hydrogen with the water that is going a bit quicker. Also motivation about removing water, so we can avoid the effect of high and very high steam concentration. That is a, a very bad effect on the kinetics of the catalyst for the hydrogen synthesis and also avoiding the catalyst degradation. That is, for example, in the zeolite under high thermal conditions at very high CO2 conversions. Imagine that for each mole of CO2, we are producing uh, at least two moles of, of water. So, and if you are producing long hydrocarbons that you are reducing the number of moles with carbons, you, not, you can end up with, with compositions that have around 80% of steam at the outlet of your reactor. And this is very demanding for the catalyst. So about kinetics and degradation. Also, with the membrane in situ, we can control the hardened content along the reactor, and that favors the conversion to target products, that is selectivity. So this is an example of, of our concept. So this is uh, for a protonic ceramic electrolyte. So typically we have water, we can extract the protons and inject them into the reaction chamber. And here the, the hydrogen is reacting with the CO2, is producing water, and is producing the hydrocarbons. Okay. But still, as you see, we have we will have a lot of water. If we can change this electrolyte by having a co-ionic ceramic electrolyte, we can still inject the protons from the water, but extract the oxygen atoms from the CO2. So reducing the concentration of water leading to the positive uh, aspects I already said. And finally, uh, we have integrated in the reactor sequential catalytic reactors, that is the reverse water gas shift, the intermediate hydrocarbon formation, and the target hydrocarbons. And that is in a sequential uh, manner and also with a hybrid catalyst. So the enabling components for these aspects are, so we'll have a compact electrochemical reactor favoring the, the heat transfer, but also the mass, the control mass transfer through the electrolyte, coionic electrolyte, and we'll have a hybrid catalyst, typically, you know, uh, like metallic sites together with uh, an acid site or a zeolite to have shape selectivity. This is how it is arranged. So we typically have a, a tubular cell. The, this is the electrolyte. So the, the, the red one is the electrolyte. Ooh, steam is flowing here around. We are taking the protons and they are injected into the reaction chamber where we have the catalyst and oxygen from the water and CO2 is removed and extracted outside in the steam chamber. Uh, the typical cells we are having is, is like this. So we have a tubular cell like one centimeter of diameter 
and we are passing inside the CO2 flow and outside the, the steam. And then the reaction is taking place here in the catalyst. I have a small video that uh, that summarizes what I say, but with cartoons and moving a bit more uh, fancy. Let me see if that starts. So, so CO2 is injected here in the reaction chamber. We have we have the catalyst. CO2 is uh, first uh, transformed into CO and then is further hydrogenated into intermediates. Water is removed because water is a product of this reaction and then we produce the hydrocarbons depending on the catalyst, the metallic phase or, or on the on the zeolite, we will go for one or other hydrocarbon. And of course, that depends on temperature. OK, then this is the type of cell we are using. I said uh, this is based on, on previous work of, of the consortium. And this is the electrolyte is around 10 to 15 uh, microns, or in this case, it's a, it's a barium circonate based protonic conductor. And this is the, the electrolyte. This is the, the steam electrode. Uh, we call it positrode, but it's a steam electrode where we need several functions like uh, electronic charge carriers. Uh, we have protonic charge carriers and in our project we will need uh, also another phase conducting uh, another uh, an, another path for conducting the oxide ions. And this is how they look like as, as a cell. So in in our, our approach to meet this, we are developing co-ionic electrolytes uh, that enable the transport of protons and oxygen ions. We'll have uh, a hydrogen electrode active and inert under the operation conditions. The hydrogen, the, hydrogen, the hydrogen in the hydrogenation environment should avoid coke formation and methanation because that will reduce the selectivity and the efficiency of the process. And uh, now we are exploring catalytic routes based on, on on hybrid uh, fission drops uh, catalyst, among other routes. If we look uh, at the potential of reducing the temperature of the cell, because we are talking about solid oxide is protonic, but it's solid oxide technology. So we are looking at, at materials that are based on barium, zirconium, cerium, yttrium, or iterbium, for example, or, or other fancy compositions that this is the state of the art. And you see that they uh, exhibit interesting conductivities already at 400 uh, degrees Celsius. So that makes it very challenging to couple with CO2 hydrogenation. Uh, the main challenge we are facing, of course, are first, we have to couple uh, complex catalysis with electrochemical cell, and we have to match to bridge the, the conditions for both. That is tricky. So going down in the temperature of operation of the cell and rising the operation temperature of the catalyst while keeping the, the selectivity and also manufacturing of large cells with novel components, as you know, is very challenging. Also, we have other challenges are, that are related to the uh, context and the general uh, pro, uh, scope of the process. Those are related to the CO2 stream capture. So we have to know the compositions, impurities, the conditions we get them, and also we have to be aware about the cost of capture and cleaning them. So we have to look very carefully at the integration because integration will make uh, this, this technology a, a winner one. Uh, and also social perception as acceptance. If society or people is not accepting the technology, uh, there will be no future for, for this uh, type of technologies, not only for ECOCO, in general for CCU. So then the objectives are already uh, uh, described, so we have a co-ionic electrolyte, so we have to adapt to uh, have adequate uh, mix of co-ionic conductivity. We have we need nice active electrode, also stable in those conditions, and we need the hybrid catalyst to for the fuel uh, jet fuel production. So in the project, we are targeting first methanation, then intermediate hydrocarbons like olefins, and in the end, jet fuel. So we have like uh, intermediate milestones for that. Then with these two, we are manufacturing electrochemical cells and then assembling with the catalyst tubular reactors. We'll make a demonstration in this type of reactor that has 18 uh, tools, uh, uh, tubular cells that with a length of 25 centimeters. And we have already done the design. This is uh, the this is the original idea of this is coming from a previous project, Electra, coordinated by Tools Norway in, in Oslo. Then we have a, a, a very strong activity on process engineering because 
the integration and the techno economics is, is helping in the decision on, on materials development and, and, and selection. And finally, we have the social perception that is taking all the flavors of the project uh, to to get inside into the social perception. There will be a presentation about this this afternoon. The partners, uh, we have uh, leading companies on on the different uh, sectors that are uh, unfortunately producing CO2. So CIMIX, ArcelorMittal, Ira Group, and, and Shell. Uh, and Costec is, is also producing CO2, but in this case, the role is more on the membrane uh, technology. And as uh, academic partners, we have uh, CSIC that we are working on the protonic uh, cells, but also on the on the on the catalysis together with CMN University. And on the protonic part, we have uh, UPV uh, University of Oslo, Sintef, and Kyushu University. And for social perception, we have RBTH Aachen. So this is uh, the picture of our consortium. I have to say that I'm very proud that uh, uh, we have five uh, World Packets leaders that are led by by women. That is mm, around 70% uh, and, and, is, and is working uh, perfectly. So we are very happy about this. That was done by chance and is, it came naturally. And about the barriers, I think this is already discussed. I think the most important one is the economic, economic sustainability of of the process, so it is. It will be in future tricky. That depends on many things like uh, regulatory barriers, incentives, and regulations. Uh, we will depend also on upstream technologies, on capture and cleaning, and appropriate integration to the to our technology or other CCU technologies. Uh, so we will depend also availability of required associated infrastructure again related to CO2 transport or capture. And of course, uh, the te technology should be accepted by, by society and, and lay people. So on dissemination, uh, you can find out in uh, find out, find out in, in, in the ICOCO uh, website, so ICOCO.eu, where we are also posting uh, different documents in the in Twitter and, and LinkedIn. And uh, I think that's everything from our side. So I'm I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Jose, uh, for this very, very interesting presentation. You, you were almost on time, but then you... <laughs> but it's okay, it's okay. Uh, so we have already a question on the, uh, on the chat box. The first question from uh, Alejandro Mojales. Um, so, Jose, what is the current conversion of CO2? And what is the jet fuel selectivity in these tubular reactors? Could you comment on that? So uh, this is a, a very good question. Uh, I cannot tell you too much because we are working on that and I don't have the, the, the permission of to share all of this, but I can tell you that at the moment for the temperature where we are, we are uh, better than the state of the art, okay? So we are talking about conversions about above 50% or more, okay? Okay, and uh, regarding the let's say the jet fuel selectivity, do you think that this technology will lead to significant improvement in terms of uh, uh, hydro treatment, for example, later on? Do you produce jet fuel with a high selectivity? Well, the 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 point here is the integration because if we look at the hydrocarbons, we can get high selectivity. The only point is is to how to recirculate, for example, the carbon monoxide that uh, due to the operation temperature probably will have uh, a high or relatively high uh, carbon monoxide selectivity. Okay, that that's clear. Uh, but I think with the right zeolites and catalysts and tuning the conditions, we can go for, we can direct to jet fuel or other hydrocarbons. Okay, thank you very much. We have also a question from uh, Michael Sampas. Uh, what would be the ratio of proton to oxygen ion conductivity? and how uh, this ratio and how the conductivity is affected with temperature. Does this impose some extra boundaries on the operating condition? Well, uh, of course, this is this can be a boundary. Uh, mm -hmm. How uh, the ratio typically we need uh, because of the high content of oxygen in CO2, uh, because it's twice than carbon, we need uh, uh, typically more uh, oxygen transport than proton transport. Uh, Typically, the activation energy of oxygen transport is higher, so 
mm, then the lower the temperature, the higher the protonic one. This is, uh, we can see the other way around. By temperature, I can trick this transport and adjust to the conditions. And of course, that is a boundary, but uh, once it is selected, we have the right to manufacture with the materials and the, the formulation uh, suitable for, for the best conditions, although we will have some freedom. Huh? Okay. Maybe just a very last question very quickly. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, you were focusing first on methanation uh, and so that you balance endothermic, um, endothermal electrolysis with exothermal reaction. Mm -hmm. What is the temperature profile in the reactor? Is it quite flat? Can you comment on that? Yeah, uh, for the, uh, we were uh, happily surprised. This is CFD modeling, okay? And I, I cannot share you, but I can tell you that the, it was quite flat and, and the temperature was not rising because we were able, at least on the modeling, to run uh, below the, the thermoneutral point. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, so thank you very much, Jose, for this very, very nice presentation and uh, the answer to your question, to the questions. So yeah. we will transit now to the next presentation. Uh, so uh, I'm calling Dr. Middlecoop for the CO2 Focus project. And you have 15 minutes uh, presentation. I will just raise my hand uh, two minutes before the end of the presentation, and then we get five minute question. You can go. Okay. We don't, yeah, we don't see your presentation first. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. Okay, great. Is that all right? This is perfect. If you can be in presenter presenter yes, mode, and then it's perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's supposed to come out. Yeah, there we go. Thank you very much. Okay, as uh, earlier today introduced, uh, this is CO2 Focus. Um, I'm Vesna Middelkoop, I'm the coordinator, and I'll be presenting just a general um, direction lines of um, CO2 Focus. We'll have two more presentations coming along, so it will be plenty of it. Uh, this is just a um, quick snapshot of who we are and uh, uh, what's uh, CO2 Focus composed of. So we have 12 partners uh, with us. We had the Chinese uh, partner too, as it was required by the call, but in the meantime, Chinese partner has dropped out, unfortunately. Uh, other than that, there are only 25 research organizations on board. Uh, we have quite a large presence of uh, SMEs. You will see uh, some of them will be previewed uh, in my presentation. And we have uh, our uh, industrial partner as well. Sorry. Yeah. So we started, uh, as some of you uh, have started to just not long ago, we are just now at the time of our uh, month eight in the um, project review. So we have some preliminary results, some of which we'll be able to share. Uh, they're quite exciting. Uh, other than that, we are looking forward probably to uh, our live next time um, workshop where we are actually going to see some of our results and maybe even uh, bring some uh, demo models uh, to share with you. So the concept, as it was also briefly introduced early on, is uh, focused on cutting edge technology, what we consider cutting edge, uh, because it is uh, dealing with a directly converted CO2 uh, with in presence of um, H2 for dimethyl ether. Some of, uh, projects are also dealing with it. It's kind of interesting to have some cluster on uh, DME uh, fuel. Uh, what's uh, um, distinctive here is that we are employing uh, innovative 3D printed multi-channel catalytic reactors and solid oxide electrolyzers. And we'll try towards the end of the project to integrate them. Uh, we have a dedicated industrial, uh, de dedicated industrial environment, which is our um, uh, partner and their refinery site. They're actually large industrial CO2 point source and they have loads of CO2 to spare. However, it is going to be only a uh, demo uh, unit installed there. So we'll see how actually to illustrate on such a large uh, site how this type of system can work in practice. Uh, as you already all know, this is kind of a flow chart, what we expect in direct conversion of uh, CO2 uh, and H2 to DME. DME can be used uh, in chemical sector, but we are uh, also 
as our partner petrochemical industry is, but we're also uh, trying to promote DME as a potential uh, fuel of the future. Of course, uh, the main um, question here we will touch only upon, but more mostly in terms of uh, our uh, cost benefits analysis and uh, business plan, but we won't have uh, integrated in the project because it's only TLR5 project. Uh, is actually the heat and the uh, energy uh, consumption in entire cycle, as you can uh, already yourself uh, guess, and half of the cost will come from electrolysis because it's a high te uh, temperature uh, solid oxide electrolyzer. Ideally, we would uh, do this in combination with intermittent or renewable energy sources, but that's for the future, obviously. On the other side, uh, we are hopeful that um, our CO2 source, uh, industrial source, will provide a good range, a good uh, a good type of uh, CO2 flow and, um, yeah, say purity, uh, which will uh, perfectly work in uh, in our uh, reactor design, our process design. What is key to this, what is very central to this, is actually back to uh, the very nitty-gritty of it, is just uh, our catalyst design. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're commercial catalysts for DME production, or basically most uh, like for methanol production that you can be easily purchased. So you would argue, yeah, what's the advance there? But we have there are certain issues with uh, commercially available catalysts, so we are heavily uh, uh, dedicated to uh, improving this catalyst. There are a couple of partners to, uh, working on it. They have been working in the past eight months. We are trying to obtain, of course, higher selectivity and conversion for this direct uh, uh, process of CO2 conversion to DME. But on top of that, we also are working on catalyst design itself. So the catalyst itself will be a monolithic design, which has uh, which serves as a multi-channel catalytic reactor in itself. But you will see further down in uh, following slides and also in a later presentation that we will try to scale this whole process up, up just by employing also multi-tubular result uh, uh, re reactors. So it's going to be multi-channel, multi-tubular catalytic reactor. One of our uh, key partners for design is uh, an SME uh, hybrid catalysis, which has uh, 20 years track record in designing uh, catalysts for uh, small scale uh, production, but also uh, for the really larger scale. So they're quite confident in uh, what they're doing at the moment. For uh, CO2 focus, they have typical test rigs where uh, they have a high capacity of um, screening mul uh, in parallel reactors and uh, in multiple loadings and, and tubes of different sizes. So that can go pretty fast because many of these projects actually end up um, quite long time dwelling on uh, simple screening of the catalyst compositions. So we are at this stage um, quite advanced in screening our hybrid catalysts and um, kind of pre-selecting, narrowing down the short list of the potential most, potential most promising catalyst um, compositions. Uh, alongside this, there is a little sidetrack, you call it, but uh, we thought of giving a chance another kind of um, hybrid concept uh, by employing uh, ca uh, carbon nanotube membrane reactors. Carbon nanotubes are known for uh, their exotic geometry and as they are tu tubular, kind of tubular uh, nanoscale uh, reactors. So we're trying to confine, there is a specific dedicated task of, of, on confinement of the active catalyst particles within uh, the carbon nanotubes. We have kind of promising results, but as you could also imagine, which is also allowed in this project at TLR 3 to 4, we are still um, at the early stages. There is not yet scale up done on this, but we are just trying to compare whether our more like commercial mainstream catalyst, which you already know is copper, zinc, alumina based catalyst, uh, will actually compete with the um, uh, carbon nanotube uh, design. Uh, on top of that, we already have um, um, some amount of CO2 that we can spare, so we use that supercritical CO2 for uh, deposition of um, uh, heterogeneous uh, catalyst particles. So we have kind of, as is illustrated here, uh, 
already printed bodies, like supports, basically, which we try to deposit uh, within the supercritical CO2 uh, process. That's another part of ACON which is working on it. Uh, after that, we have, after pr having produced uh, powders on a substantial scale, and uh, the scales are definitely uh, sufficient at the moment on a, like, say, 100 gram scale that we can uh, print uh, multiple monoliths. So uh, at the moment, uh, Vito is uh, doing that, like screening different uh, printed catalysts. If you ask why uh, 3D printing of any kind of catalyst or solvents or any kind of catalytic reactor structures, it's only for the main reason that the distribution of active material is uh, beneficial due to the high surface area, high surface area to volume ratios. And these type of uh, structures, molecules, they have higher adaptability and we have a uh, pretty good control over the design and flow pathways. And as you know, if you compare it to, to the pack bed, a very conventional pack bed, we have a uh, low pressure drop by the design of these channels, multiple channels, and uh, we are also work on improving mass and heat transfer within them. Uh, to speed this a little bit up, because I, I'm seeing the time is quickly running out, uh, we have an uh, in-house system for uh, very quick uh, prototyping, rapid prototyping as they call it, but this is actually direct right the way we call it. We mix different compositions and uh, we can print them uh, by direct right. Uh, just in general, uh, the flexibility of uh, this technique reflects in that, that it's, uh, can offer bespoke patterning. We can just pattern on the fly, just we can design uh, the monolith uh, channels and also mix different type of materials. This is just a quickly at a glance that so far we have a long track record of designing different types of catalyst formulations and adsorbents and including some other reactor components such as uh, silicon carbide, carbide uh, fillers of the reactors also for heat management and just uh, design of the reactor. Back to CO2 focus, so what we currently do, as I said, we are um, preparing different compositions. As you can see, some of them are as prepared, directly used for printing. We can also calcine them and then prepare them, pre print them and uh, employ, employ them directly into reactors. So we are playing with this, as you know, that every step of catalyst design has uh, an effect on the final uh, resulting uh, catalyst structure and its performance. So F the change in a step of uh, catalyst design has an effect on this. Uh, at the moment, we are screening catalyst monoliths in uh, single tubular reactors. Uh, we are trying to tune the temperature pressure and just look at different compositions and their selectivity and conversion depending on what type of composition is employed. As you can see, we want to uh, move the catalytic activity towards lower temperature just for energy saving reasons. As uh, also discussed in a previous presentation and probably many presentations today are dealing with the same issue. So more on this will be shown in uh, Giuseppe Bonura's uh, presentation. Furthermore, uh, as I said, the um, multi-channel multi st catalytic structures, the monoliths will be employed also in multiple tubular reactor. Uh, Technalia is working on this. This is process and in intensification efforts and uh, yeah, we're optimizing the heat distribution and uh, simply um, that this was uh, enable us to scale up the entire process uh, uh, the way we see it. Uh, Susanna uh, Perez will uh, talk about it in, um, in the presentation tomorrow. On the other hand, the hydrogen is coming from a, a typical uh, a solid oxide electrolyzer that's commercially available. Solid power is working uh, on it just to adjust it for exact capacity that we need it for this project. As you know, as it's also uh, mentioned with, uh, by Elk again, uh, this is a nickel-based uh, type of system. They're going to use LSCF uh, and, uh, with uh, GDC interlayer and YZ as an electrolyzer. Some of these uh, uh, typical performance uh, data sheets you can also find on their side, but basically we are trying to uh, get to 1,000 hours of operation and 4.5 uh, kilowatt uh, uh, stack, which will be employed at the final development site. 
what will be at the very end of um, the project, uh, what we envisage, this is Pat Kim's side, they will uh, allocate one um, uh, slot for us where we're going to bring these two integral units, so the react CO2 react conversion reactor and SOE electrolyzer units, and they will be just put in place. And some of the key performance indicators that we expect them to run on uh, are going to uh, succeed probably at this project level of TLR6. What we are still working on is actually uh, what's coming post-project, because this is our first project, we didn't have predecessors, we are looking forward for a successor project, which will be working beyond the state of the art or beyond TLR6, at least where we are now at. So, um, alongside all this, the very efficient catalyst uh, employed, we also have to look at the uh, design of the reactor and the good integration at the uh, industrial site. That's a key of it. We'll be dealing with it next year. But uh, uh, alongside all these technological and technical uh, and engineering concerns, uh, which our partners will be working on, that's like solid power, FACON, uh, and Ichi Kaldaya, they will be uh, mainly employed in that. We also need to provide, that's our aim towards the end of the project, to provide some technical guidelines for similar uh, composite in these similar industrial sites which are based on this, uh, which are interested actually on uh, this type of uh, technology. So what the Commission wants us just to also look and present actually the environmental, of course, uh, cost effective and uh, regulatory benefits of this type of system. So I think I just made it in time because I was a little bit uh, was speeding up towards the end, but more to come, more details on the reactor design and uh, the process intensification are coming in in uh, the other forthcoming sessions. Thank you very much for this very, very nice presentation and very complete. Uh, DME is the uh, of the future. <laughs> so they say. Yeah. Is there some questions from the audience? Okay, so, so meanwhile, maybe someone ask a question because it's lunchtime, so I, ex I expect you to be here, right, people. <laughs> but I would ask a question. Um, so, so you use an extrusion uh, methods for the 3D printing of the uh, catalyst and adsorbent. What is the method used for additive manufacturing for the reactor exchanger? Do you have any idea? Well, we can do with extrusion, actually. We can also, it's not only straight channels that we can do with extrusion itself. But uh, Technalio will present uh, tomorrow uh, their reactor design, so you will see their um, uh, just metal fusion uh, reactor design. But we can do also heat exchanges by simply um, extruding them, but patterning the channels in a different ways, and then uh, after that, uh, just doing sintering. But sintering takes place post post printing. Okay. Um Another question on my side. So what I understood is that for now, the DME has an application in the industry. Um, do you profit from uh, available steam, for example, to uh, increase the efficiency of the uh, hydrogen generation? Yes, that would be a great idea. The integration will take place next year. How is that going? I paid attention to um, Jose Sierra and uh, Eco CO2. They, they are looking into it. I did notice that. We will give it some thought with integration. Uh, yeah, depends on uh, in engineering constraints we have there on site. But okay. definitely, of course, it's a very important issue to look into. Okay, and, and, and uh, you mentioned also um, possibility also for next market for the heavy mobility, for instance. Um, do you have different, I would say, uh, purity constraints uh, between the industrial application and the mobility application? And, and do, do you consider that uh, in the reactor design? Um, well, any type of purity will be sorted out by our partner, which is going to use purification membranes at the end of the process. You mean that or prior to the reaction CO2 purification, both sides will be, we have a partner which is going to employ uh, membranes. But other than that, yeah, we, uh, we, we are looking forward to getting the right purity, but that's a major issue too. It just also depends on um, our source uh, on site. Although we 
like typically sulfur and CO2 and those kind of things. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this answer. So I think if there's not more, uh, no more question, we can thank you again for this very nice presentation and very mo promising project, uh, Team DME. So I can only agree with you with that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, yeah. So so let's go for the next presentation. Uh, we have now a presentation of Dr. Tsampas on the Carol Green project. We are just on time, so this is absolutely perfect. So uh, while you put your presentation, you have 15 minutes. I will uh, tell you two minutes before the end and five minutes for question. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, we can see. Okay, uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Michal Tsampas and I'm group leader at DIFER. DIFER stands from the Dutch Institute for Fundamental Energy Research. We are located in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Uh, today I will present uh, in the next 15 minutes, I hope, the Kero Green project or at least a few elements. This is a Horizon 2020 project between DIFER, KIT, VITO, Serpotec, High Gear and Ineratec. I will explain the role of each of the consortium partners in, in the next slides. Um, in brief, if we we move to the next slide. Okay, so uh, the Kero Green aim is the demonstration of the full chain process from uh, renewable electricity, CO2 capture, which is not part of the project, but in terms of cyclability, uh, to, uh, to kerosene. Uh, the initial stages of the project were focused on research and optimization of the individual steps, which I will analyze later. And in the beginning of the project, we're between one to three TRL level. And the idea is at the end of the project, we want to move to TRL four. Integration phase will happen in the second half of 2021 in Kalsu Institute of Technology, with the ultimate goal to produce three liters of kerosene per day. And here is the duration of uh, the project. So uh, what uh, kerosene offers is innovative conversion uh, uh, route based on uh, the steps that you see here. So we start with CO2 plasmolysis, which I will explain, electrochemical oxygen separation, which is linked with plasmolysis. Then you move to CO purification, and then is water cassif reaction for the production of syngas, and then Fischer-Tropsch synthesis and hydrocarbon, uh, heavy hydrocarbon hydrocracking for improves the efficiency of uh, the kerosene. It, so here you can see uh, where the different partners contribute on the project. And for the second part, which is more about the fischer tropsch synthesis, we, you will hear uh, tomorrow from Francisco in the, uh, more details about the uh, challenges of the project, which I will focus uh, on the first one. Are, but there are three main challenges. is the oxygen separation after plasmolysis, which I will explain. The system integration of the different technologies, not only integration, but also in the size of a container and the maximization of the energy and carbon efficiency of uh, the full chain. Here you can see the differ involvement and these two processes are uh, somehow linked is the plasmolysis. So we are working on modeling of the plasma process and optimization through experiments and comparison with the modeling, and also to do an upscaling from the existing reactors before the beginning of the project, we're in the order of one kilowatt to six kilowatt. And here you can see uh, one uh, first try of ignition of argon plasma with uh, the new reactor uh, as uh, a first test. Uh, the second part, which will be more the topic of the discussion today, is the electrochemical oxygen separation. And then this is also linked with the discussion uh, and the presentation that we saw uh, in the beginning of the session about solid oxide electrolyte cells. So we want to utilize solid oxide electrolyte cells in order to remove oxygen after plasmolysis and to purify in this way uh, as a first step the carbon monoxide which is produced. To define what, can, what kind of material requirements we need if we go to this kind of operation which is unconventional. And then we want to upscale from the one watt, which is more or less the studies we perform in the lab, to 1.5 kilowatts. So this is uh, three orders of magnitude, and this is something which is uh, quite challenging, of course. And you will see in the next slides how we will do we deal with uh, this approach. To explain why we use uh, CO2 plasmolysis, so uh, as a process uh, can be green because it's powered by renewable electricity. Uh, so this is the main input as well as uh, uh, CO2 captured. 
And then in the outlet of the reactor, you have uh, CO, CO2, and oxygen. And this is the main challenge. Um, before we go that, I would like to show you here the high energy efficiency that you can achieve depend on different kinds of uh, plasmas that you can use, power conditions, but this is maybe not really important for the moment, but you can achieve really high energy efficiency. You don't need uh, scarce materials in the plasmolysis. However, the main challenge, which is depicted here, is that in the outlet of the reactor, you have CO2, CO, and oxygen, and then the chemical value of this gas mixture is not so high. You can use it for heating, but not easily for further chemical processing, so you need to go for the uh, oxygen separation. In the beginning of the process, during the submission phase, we were discussing and thinking many different approaches for oxygen separation. We couldn't find something that it was uh, better than uh, utilizing uh, solid oxide electrolyte uh, cells. So due to the lack of literature and the difficulty of the process, we decided to give a try with uh, this approach. And here is how we were envisioned at this stage, uh, the conceptual design of the plasma integrated uh, solid oxide uh, electrolyte cell, so offering a new uh, operation of the cell. So as you can see here on the left part of this reactor, you have the CO2 plasmolysis to CO and oxygen. And then upon polarization, you can transfer oxygen from one side to the other. And then in this respect, you can uh, uh, increase the value of this uh, uh, chemical mixture. The materials here, maybe just, uh, we, we call it fewer electrode or plasma electrode. So sometimes in the next slides, you will hear the same. And the counter electrode or oxygen electrode is something that we also, uh, we also use. The material requirements as explained before in the other presentation is that in such kinds of cells, you need to have uh, high efficiency, which is translated mainly with some properties like mixed ionic electronic conductivity of the electrodes, low over potential losses, which can be also translated in high activity. You want to have electrolytes with uh, high oxygen ion conductivity. Normally, this means that are thin electrolytes. We haven't used these kind of electrolytes in this project, but this is something that we examine in the integrated phase. And the key performance indicator is high oxygen fluxes and, of course, stability. Uh, the literature on the plasma, uh, on the SOEC uh, cells was really uh, useful. However, we use a very unconventional mixture. We don't use oxygen or CO2. We use something which is in the between. And uh, for this reason, we have a mixture which is not in a thermal equilibrium. So you have always the possibility to have CO oxidation back to CO2. And this is something that we would like to avoid. And uh, you will see what we have done uh, so far. So in order to develop a plasma electrode or fuel electrode, we started with literature review on perovskite materials, mainly with uh, good redox uh, properties. And then uh, our partner Serpotec start to make some of these materials. And then we continue to catalytic test to define which of them are not so good in uh, CO oxidation. And then we applied in solid oxide electrolyte cells we perform electrocatalytic tests that you will see later with a perspective to go to the integrated uh, approach. But we are discussing something that uh, we are here. Among the materials that uh, we tried, there are uh, a lot of materials in the literature, but we couldn't identify some with pure um, uh, catalytic activity, but good electrocatalytic activity. And it seems that these two are somehow linked. Uh, but I will show you some of the results uh, with uh, the electrode that we choose to continue our studies. In order to uh, make a simulation of uh, feeding a plasmolysis reactor output to uh, SOEC, we consider 10% of CO2, this is for practical lesion and gas analysis. And uh, this 10% of CO2, if you uh, if undergoes a 30% plasmolysis conversion, then you come with a mixture of Five, 7% uh, of CO2, 3% of CO, and 1.5% of oxygen. And we fed in this kind of reactor. And in this case, three reactions can happen on the top part, which is the more interesting. The un unwanted, of course, the back reactions to CO2. And then the electrocatalytic reaction, which is the oxygen pumping from one side to the other, and the CO2 electrolysis. The desired is the oxygen pumping and CO2 electrolysis in terms of Oxygen separation can be considered as neutral. However, it's very beneficial to increase the amount of CO. 
Uh, we started with this material. This is SFM. This is a double perovskite. We made symmetrical cells here. You can see some details which at the moment are not so essential. And we uh, evaluate the performance in a broad temperature range from 650 to 850. And as you can see, the current density is increasing. I don't have here the scale because uh, we haven't published yet the results. And this is something that we plan to do uh, soon. Uh, as you see, the current is increasing as you increase the uh, temperature. This means that we can extract more oxygen, but as you will see, this has also an effect on the CO oxidation reactions. So in order to evaluate this performance, we have to perform transient experiments. So you see steps of 20 minutes of experiments, which give us time to analyze uh, the levels of CO in the outlet of the reactor and the oxygen levels. And we compare, for simplicity reasons, uh, the levels versus the feed. So as you can see here, always at open circuit conditions, you can have uh, a, a lot of CO uh, losses because uh, this comes from uh, 15 to 50 percent losses in this uh, temperature range because of the CO oxidation. However, under polarization, we are able to start increasing the amount of CO when we enter the CO2 electrolysis region. And at the same time, as you can see here, we were able to lower the levels of oxygen up to uh, 93%. So we were able to leave only 7% of oxygen. So this uh, shows that um, SOECs can be used as oxygen separator in the concept of plasmolysis. And in all cases, high Faradayic efficiencies were achieved. So uh, using these findings, we continue and benchmark the performance of our cells with conventional uh, CO2 electrolysis. And here you can see the IV curves in both cases. Here is with uh, the mixture of plasmolysis and here is with the CO2 electrolysis. In the region of CO2, there is no big difference. However, here you can see that you can report some currents, which means this is normal because you have oxygen on your gas mixture and thus you can do this oxygen pumping. So below this region, oxygen pumping is, of course, possible in the plasmolysis simulated gas mixture, but not for the case of CO2 electrolysis. And here you can see that actually CO2 electrolysis is happening slightly above 0 0.75 volts. And what is more striking and more interesting for us is that in, in terms of stability, if you can compare the two operations in the 1.25 volts, you see that in, uh, in both cases, you see a degradation as reported before. However, uh, in the case of plasmolysis gas mixture, we see a performance which is higher and more interesting when you go to uh, below or at least close to the threshold of CO2 electrolysis, the performance is not affected with the time and it is actually slightly uh, increased. So utilizing uh, these findings, I would like to, to summarize and give you the outlook. Oxygen separation using CO2 plasmolysis equivalent mixture has been demonstrated. This is important for us because different activities is in the beginning of the process chain. And if this fails, then the rest of the, uh, the efficiency of the next steps will be very low. And uh, also some insights is that lowering operating temperature decrease the amount of uh, CO oxidation losses, but also the oxygen separation. So in this case, you need to find a, a solution out of uh, this uh, framework of our studies, and this I will explain you later. And the idea is that we can improve stability when we operate with a mixture that it has already oxygen. This is uh, more technical, and I don't want to go to these details. I could answer maybe in the questions. And as an outlook, we use this input that we have uh, uh, obtained through these studies uh, to a commercial vendor to make this uh, 1.5 kilowatt unit because this was impossible to do in the consortium in the time frame. And the idea is if we use uh, SOEC architectures with very thin uh, electrolytes, then you can allow operation at lower temperature, so less CO2, CO losses. But at the same time, you can maintain high oxygen pumping rates. And then we believe that in this uh, perspective, we will be able to do oxygen separation and having uh, very small CO losses. And uh, 
we plan to use these materials in this uh, so-called uh, plasmolysis and OECOC uh, integrated approach, but this is in uh, a benchtop uh, scale at the moment uh, in the lab. And here you can see this is what I was promising, the container size part of differ with the oxygen separation and uh, the plasmolysis unit. And uh, at this stage, I would like to uh, thank you for your attentions and also the partner of the project, TIT, Vito, Serpotec, High Gear, and Ineratec, and all of you for, uh, for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, for this very nice uh, presentation. So you're just on time. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so there's already one question in the in the chat box, but I, I um, think you just replied to this one. But I will ask it again. Uh, would it be possible to insert uh, your membrane in your plasma reactor as well, or should you always go for post-plasma treatments? Yeah, this is, this is possible. And actually, we have already done a few things in a, in a frame of a different project. So this is what something that we have already done for the case of nitrogen fixation. Uh, and this is the idea. And here, maybe briefly, I can show you what is the idea, how we could do something like that. We have the setup. We have developed partially uh, this part, but is not yet implemented. There are quite a lot of challenges which related with sealing, how you will approach the plasma. But indeed, this is something which is feasible, and we are working on, on this direction. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, if, if there is any other question uh, from the audience, please uh, would say use the chat box. Meanwhile, I will ask a question on, on my own. Uh, I was wondering, um, so uh, what, what is the, the level of purity uh, of the CO2 you need to achieve in order would say, to operate this plasma reactor and, 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 and integrate it with the soil do you have? Because, you know, uh, the soil are quite sensitive to sulfur, for example. So did you study that or do you plan to study that? Uh, no, we, we haven't studied that. Indeed, this may be a concept, but if you see, uh, indeed, it's very interesting, but if you see all the process chain that we have to do, to put an extra, uh, uh, let's say, boundary condition with the sulfur, I don't know if it is possible through um, uh, this project. For the CO2 plasmolysis, I think this might affect a bit the performance, but uh, since as a process, uh, plasma can be considered as, uh, as, as a hammer, my, my colleagues will not maybe like that. I don't believe that the sulfur impurities will affect the plasma. Certainly can affect the SOEC operation, and this is something that, uh, that we know. Okay. Maybe as in a follow-up project, we can examine uh, something like that. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, maybe... Uh, we still have some time for questions, so I, I will go on. Um, I was wondering, so you mentioned that in order to get nice uh, electrochemical oxygen pumping performance, you needed a thin electrolytes. Um, do you expect some high, uh, some degradation and high level of degradation from your soic uh, cells? This is something that we do uh, with a commercial uh, vendor that they have uh, the experience uh, on how to operate this from what I have seen, because whatever we need to do, we need to do it in a scale of 1.5 kilowatts. So this is quite sensitive when we are in the process of how we can integrate these materials and the operating conditions. It seems that it's possible. Of course, you need to be a bit careful with the potential that you will apply, the potential range, what we do in the lab and what you should do within the, uh, with this uh, high power level uh, electrolysis is uh, quite different. So this is something that we will examine in the integrated uh, phase. Uh, but the operation that, uh, the experiment that I saw with the thick electrolytes were at 750 degrees. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that if you lower the temperature, the degradation will not uh, be so significant. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. We have another question uh, still from Taj. Um, why did you choose uh, radio frequency plasma and, and why didn't you go for a dielectric barrier discharge or GAR uh, plasma? Yes, in uh, in this in this project we have we examined two approaches. So in terms of scaling up, if you see the previous slide, I didn't put so much attention. This is a microwave plasma because we have a lot of experience. And then if you go here, the radio frequency and the microwaves are the ones that they go to high energy efficiency. 
Uh, I don't have here the studies with a DBD. The DBD have the uh, advantage to operate at uh, one bar. However, the disadvantage is that in terms of energy efficiency, you are much lower, so you are in the in, in this area. So this is the main uh, issue. And uh, now you need to consider when you do the lab studies, how you can match the power demands. This is a kilowatt unit. And then in the lab scale, we have the RF uh, plasma reactor, which in terms of power, it has a closer matching. So it's only from technical point of view this we, that we try this, this kind of matching. Okay, uh, I hope this answer is, uh, is okay for you. Yeah, very clear. Thanks, uh, it's still in touch. Okay, maybe just maybe a final question, just maybe a prospective one. Um, if we maybe have an opinion on, on the, the scaling of the technology, do you think that this uh, radio frequency uh, plasma reactor would fit well with intermittent electricity supply or do you need, I would say, a quite permanent power supply for that? This is uh, this is something that uh, we we examine in. Sorry, this is something that we examine at differ, but this is. Uh, Io sono una presentazione ora fra un minuto online. So, sorry, I'm getting something else. Uh, uh, let me just deactivate. Deactivate. <laughs> it was okay. the next presenters. You can okay, go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so uh, this is something that um, plasmas as an approach is uh, you know is very flexible. To the power output, uh, we haven't established some protocols to to try that, but in principle, it's, it's not something that uh, uh, is is difficult. So okay. plasma ignition uh, takes place in, in the blink of an eye. In the blink of okay, eye. okay. So thank you very much, Michael, once again for this very nice presentation and this very uh, interesting concept that you've shown us uh, today. So I will now give the floor uh, to you the next much. presenters. Uh, so I've reactivated your mic. Um, yes, thank you. Sorry for that. <laughs> no problem. We like to hear Italian. No problem. <laughs> so uh, there will be a presentation from Dr. Bonura on, on 3D printed in catalysis development of efficient hybrid system for the direct hydrogenation of CO2 to DME. So still from the CO2 focus project, I guess. I'm um, probably right. <laughs> so the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes and, and five minutes for the question. I will raise my hand two minutes before the end. Thank you. Okay, let me to share my screen. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see it. Can you put that in presenter mode? It would be easier. Yes. I'm just... Perfect. You can go. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'm Giuseppe Bonura, senior researcher at the Institute for Advanced Energy Technologies of Italian Research Council, and the focus of my research group is in CCU technologies and development of catalytic systems for alternative fuel production. So in line with the recent policies on CO2 sequestration and recycling to bulk chemicals and fuels, uh, by this presentation I'm going to show you some preliminary catalytic results obtained uh, in CO2 focus project dealing with the direct hydrogenation of carbon dioxide to dimethyl ether, DME, in presence of a structured hybrid catalyst prepared by 3D printing. So starting from the need of reducing CO2 emissions, uh, I'll show you the act and novel routes to DME, describing first the conventional two-step processes and then the feasibility of an integrated one-step process of CO2 hydrogenation into DME. On this account, I'll show you the behavior of a novel structured hybrid system prepared by 3D printing as a step forward for the integration of uh, two functionalities related respectively to a methanol synthesis catalyst and an acidic carrier, so to be effective in driving the formation of DME starting from carbon dioxide hydrogen mixtures. 
As previously said, the new technologies based on CO2 recycling are becoming important because it's of a great perspective using carbon dioxide as a feedstock for the sustainable production of fuels like methanol or DME. In particular, DME, as uh, already said, is a potential substitute for diesel oil due to its very good combustion properties in terms of isotan number, low emission of NOx, and near zero smoke. Traditionally, DME is produced in a two-step process involving first methanol synthesis and then methanol dehydration. Even if a methanol reactor is typically fed by syn gas obtained from fossil sources, the direct production of DME via carbon dioxide hydrogenation is particularly attractive because it can contribute to contain emissions of greenhouse gas. From a thermodynamic point of view, carbon dioxide hydrogenation reaction to produce DME is powered at high pressure. And being an exothermic reaction, it is also powered at low temperature. In particular, by analyzing the complex reaction pattern of this process, you can see that when temperature increases, the conversion of CO2 progressively decreases with a clear drop uh, here not shown uh, in um, DME selectivity that is counterbalanced by an increase of carbon monoxide, the monoxide which represents the main byproduct of this process. Moreover, the main merit of the direct production of DME is a lower thermodynamic limitation than the process of CO2 conversion stopping to the formation of methanol. So the first step in a conventional two-step process is methanol synthesis in which a copper-based catalyst is commonly used. On this account, several scientific papers agree on the need to enter some other oxides into catalytic formulation in order to improve some physical properties of uh, the copper catalyst. Moreover, to improve activity, selectivity and lifetime, many research groups have also adopted unconventional preparation methods, but several questions are still undefined. Regarding the second step of a conventional two-step process for DME production, it involves the use of an acidic catalyst, such as gamma lumina, zeolites, or heteropolyacids. In an integrated process, the two steps, methanol synthesis and methanol dehydration to DME, must occur simultaneously. So a typical catalyst should have activity in conversion of carbon dioxide and hydrogen at low temperature, a specific functionality for methanol dehydration, an optimal distribution among different sites, a hydrophobic character to inhibit water absorption. This graph displays some recent results published in literature of DME productivity obtained on multifunctional systems tested under similar conditions. As you can see, despite mechanical mixture between a methanol phase and an acidic phase represent the most used system for DME production, it is really possible to achieve a superior DME productivity in presence of hybrid systems, where a metal oxide phase can be generated directly in presence of the acid phase.
So it is evident that the interaction among metal oxides and acidic sites at the local level definitely improve catalytic performance. This can be considered as the results of a better distribution achieved during preparation, distribution that is fundamental for promoting methanol transfer from metal oxide sites on which uh, methanol is formed to the nehibor sites of the acidic phase leading to DMH. In spite of this potential demonstrated uh, by hybrid catalysts in this process, the new frontier of research is now focused on the process intensification to be realized through a full control of catalyst properties with a tailored design of system for a suitable heat and mass transfer and low pressure drop. As uh, previously introduced by Dr. Middelkoop, this is the core activity of the European project CO2 Focus, which aims to apply 3D printing as an innovative approach to lay down functional materials with high fidelity, tunability of properties and near exact repeatability. In particular, our partner Vito printed a series of different 3D catalysts for the CO2 conversion into DME by using a slurry composed by a copper based phase plus an acidic carrier. Please, I can't add more in this moment. Uh, this slurry represents the past to be printed for the preparation of the catalyst. This is the experimental setup already shown by Vesna for the testing of Catalyst. For a proper comparison of the catalytic performance, the screening was performed under a kinetic regime at 30 bar, a range of temperature comprised between 200 and 216 degrees centigrade. By using a fixed bed reactor, so this is the preliminary step, uh, the preliminary task of the project in which we use a conventional single tube reactor. Uh, this reactor is located inside the stainless steel rod for a better control of the axial and radial gradients of temperature. Prior to each test, the catalysts were pre-activated in situ under a hydrogen atmosphere. And uh, moreover, the reaction stream was analyzed by a ZC equipped with a two column separation system connected to a flame ionized detector and a thermal conductivity detector. As you can see in this uh, transmission electron microscopy image, really the 3D printing procedure allows a very good homogeneity of a precursor distribution at the local level over the acidic surface of the carrier. Obviously, this analysis was performed on a 3D monolith after crashing and the catalyst uh, was pre-activated in hydrogen atmosphere. So some uh, preliminary result uh, on the basis of the reference hybrid composition previously identified uh, and then printed in this slide uh, is reported the comparison between uh, conventional powder, the behavior of conventional powders and uh, the 3D printed catalyst. Really, the activity selectivity pattern appears slight, slightly more efficient for the conventional powders at any temperature considered, with the maximum CO2 conversion values close to 17% at 260 degrees centigrade, and DM yield the blue bars below near 6%. Instead for the 3D printed samples, the maximum conversion was 
13%, with a yield of about 5%. So as you can see, less than 1% uh, as the difference left in terms of DM yield, and uh, it is on this difference that uh, we are working on. To understand uh, the reasons, uh, anyway, for this difference, uh, we performed uh, some porous image analysis on the conventional 3D printed catalyst, being evidenced how during printing the catalyst undergoes a dramatic loss of microporosity, which in some cases is uh, partially recovered during a run at high temperature. Likely, the procedure of 3D printing brings some issue to the textural properties of the materials, maybe due to the bander, uh, but we are confident we can address these problems in the next preparations. An important aspect during printing is also the pH of the past. In fact, typically the past is diluted in a basic solution and to understand the effects of a pH on the final catalyst performance, Vito printed some other catalysts at different pH. In any case, as you can see, within the limits of experimental error, a certain difference was observed under the adopted range of pH investigated, uh, suggesting some possible benefit of an higher pH on the catalytic behavior, an aspect which uh, will require uh, further investigation uh, in the next uh, preparation. Another important aspect is the precalcination of phases. In this respect, Vito printed uh, other catalysts for DME production. In one of these uh, preparations without uh, calcination of the copper phase, the methanol phase, while in the other one without uh, calcination of the acidic component. Then uh, their catalytic performance was compared with uh, a system which both the functionalities were preliminarily activated. And uh, as it is possible to observe before printing, it is important to stabilize both the copper phase and the acidic phase because of precalcination seems to be fundamental not only for a proper extent of the metal oxide interface, which is crucial for CO2 activation as known, but also for a suitable availability of acid sites necessary for the dehydration of methanol into DMH. Well, uh, summarizing uh, the latest results obtained uh, uh, in the frame of CO2 focus project under CO2 hydrogenation conditions, we have found some important conclusion regarding the potential of 3D catalysis. In fact, uh, 3D printed catalysts show a promising behavior for the synthesis of DME favoring a perfect mix among active sites of different nature, a certain tunability of key properties, and perfect reproducibility in terms of preparation. Uh, this uh, aspect being determinant for a proper scale up of process and technology. Obviously, for an effective 3D catalyst, uh, uh, there are uh, some other aspects uh, to be carefully controlled before and during printing, uh, like the pre-activation of phases uh, or the pH of the printing past uh, as shown. And for sure, many uh, of these aspects uh, will come early in the light. What is important is that 3D catalysis can represent the 
Uh, the silver bullet to allow CO2 activation at a reaction temperature low enough to favor IDME productivity as requested in an industrial process. Uh, as uh, already said, there are uh, many aspects deserving further investigation and among others, the possibility to adopt several uh, alternative configuration of 3D catalyst within a single reactor as the first step for a proper process intensification in structured multi-tubular 3D reactors printable on demand uh, based on the process specification. At last, uh, I would like to thank the financial sources for this study, namely CO2 Fox, uh, but also other inputs from other active projects in the CCU field. Many thanks to my research group for fundamental support and of course all of you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much Giuseppe. Uh, we are a bit uh, late as the session must be should be finished right now. But I want to thank you for this very nice uh, uh, presentation and introduction uh, of the 3D printing catalyst performances. Is there any question from the audience? Um, don't hesitate, I would say, if you want to ask it, either write it in the chat box or take directly uh, the floor. Otherwise, I may ask, uh, I would say, a, a first question. So I was wondering, so obviously, um, uh, the use of uh, copper is uh, really, I would say, on one of the first on the list in terms of metal for uh, methanol and DME production. Are you expecting alternative uh, metals to be used as precursor for the uh, for this reaction? Uh, the, thank you for the question. Um, the new frontier of the research uh, is uh, now moving uh, uh, towards indium as an alternative uh, uh, active phase to copper. The problem of indium is uh, well, the low activity in spite of uh, um, high selectivity to methanol. So um, uh, I believe that um, uh, indium isn't uh, ready to substitute copper as an active um, phase uh, in this moment. So uh, I, we believe that uh, it's important to insist on the um, on copper-based catalyst by improving the the whole composition in terms of uh, other kinds uh, of um, oxides which can enter into the composition uh, like zincum, zincum oxide or uh, zirconia in alternative to alumina which is more water tolerant than traditional alumina. I can't hear you. Sorry. Sorry. Thank okay. you, Giuseppe. <laughs> I cut in my mic. Thank you. So, so um, maybe just a last question to finish uh, the, the session. So you've displayed that for now, maybe 3D printing catalyst had a lower activity compared to conventional uh, catalyst coupled with zeolites. Uh, I was, so you've displayed also mitigation plan to improve this performance. But for now, I had a question. Um, is the intensification provided by the structured catalyst with high interfacial area compensate for this lower activity uh, when you consider the overall system? <laughs> we hope for that, obviously, uh, but uh, we are also confident that uh, we can improve the activity of this system. We are um, already working on uh, new types of binders uh, and uh, additive uh, during printing in order to 
to reach the expected targets for uh, as claimed in the in the work plane of the project. <laughs> okay, always good to respect work plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So thank you very much, Giuseppe, for this very nice presentation. Thank I feel you. that there's no more questions, so this is the end of the session. 1b i would kindly remind to all the presenters uh, to download the presentation on the website as it was asked and i really would like to uh, thank you thank all the presenters but also all the audience for the nice question but all the presenters for the nice presentation as well it was really impressive and i was glad to be uh, listening to all of that thank you very much all goodbye <laughs>